This is The Lonely Office, your playbook for navigating the messy line between work and life. Our topics are sourced from real, anonymous workplace conversations happening within Glassdoor communities. We discuss timely work-life issues so you don't have to brave the professional world alone. Hey, everybody. It's Aaron. Quick question. For those of us negotiating severance, or better yet, for those of us who are negotiating salaries, is there something that we can learn from the world of professional sports, more specifically, from the world of professional athletes? And it turns out there just might be. So we figured with the two big markets, LA and New York, the Dodgers and the Yankees facing off in the World Series, this would be perfect timing to bring back this gem from the archives. We hope you enjoy. I was excited to tell you and everybody listening about a story I came across the other day. Is it on topic? <laughs> I think you'll find that it is. I think actually it's more on topic than we think. It starts in the competitive world of professionals. We live there. Mm-hmm. We understand what that's about. <laughs> there was this young man in his late 20s, exceptional by any standard, rising through the ranks in a way that left his peers in awe. In short, basically, his skills were once in a generation. Mm. Just this past year, as his contract with his then current employer drew to a close, the stage was set for a groundbreaking contract negotiation. Drum roll. But as the legendary radio host Paul Harvey would say, here is the rest of the story. (laughs) This young professional I'm talking about wasn't climbing the corporate ladder in Silicon Valley. He wasn't brokering deals on Wall Street. He is a prodigy from Japan whose baseball bat and pitching arm have dazzled the baseball world. His name is Shohei Otani. Showtime. And the new employer he just signed with is the Los Angeles Dodgers. His contract, the largest contract in the history of professional sports. Here are the details. Buckle up. It's a 10-year, $700 million agreement. Wow. That is a lot of money. But that's not the most interesting part, actually. The most interesting part is how the contract was structured, with only a small fraction of the compensation being paid out in his annual salary. But then, you ready for this? $68 million to be paid out annually, starting from the year 2034 and going well into his retirement through 2044. So he gets paid most of it once the contract's over, after the 10 years. Once he's retired. Wow. Will the Dodgers even be solved by then? Maybe they'll take <laughs> up by then. So he has to stay for the 10 years to get the money. Well, to get the money beyond the $2 million a year. So my understanding of the contract was he gets less than 3% of the total contract value, around $2 million in salary a year. But then it has to wait till year 10 or year 11 yes. to start ah. getting these balloon $68 million payments. And at that point, I think he's in his late 30s almost, almost 40 years old. He's ready to retire. Is it bad that I've never heard of this man if he is a once-in-a-lifetime? Showtime? <laughs> he's a professional. And he's unique in the sense yeah. that he is a pitcher and a batter. So with shades of Babe Ruth, right? So he's really one of the most dynamic players ever to play the game. Very rare. Once in a generation. But this is so unusual, though, that in the sense that how it like balloons towards not only the latter half of his career, but he's going to be hanging out, yeah. sitting on a beach somewhere. A lot of the top tier managers out there taking Zoom calls, laying back on beaches, <laughs> <laughs> making $68 million per year. Leia, have you ever signed a 20-year contract? With the agency? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I think this is a really interesting story. The Shohei Otani contract has been covered widely by the media, usually within a sports framework, understandably so. In particular, how its economics and compensation compare against other sports superstar contracts. But honestly, when I first came across it, the reason the story really spoke to me is that it uncovered the realm of what was possible. For someone who's negotiated salary contracts and the sale of two startups to large companies myself, Otani's contract structure was both unconventional, but also really telling. On the one hand, you have an employee who negotiates to take less than 3% Mm. of his overall compensation for the first 10 years. That's only $2 million of salary each year. Only. (laughs) Only. (laughs) But then balloons the payments to $68 million for the 10 years following that. 
So it seems like he has a desire for long-term success over short-term and also for greater pay stability in the later lower earning years. Of course, I understand he has advertising deals paying out, but all things being equal, there's a really significant deferment of a lot of money over a period of 10 to 20 years. On the employer side, you have an organization that values winning by freeing up budget for other players, but also understands the economics at play too. Because with the current inflation rates holding constant, Otani's $700 million contract is really only worth anywhere between $325 to $400 Mm. million in today's dollars. That's almost 50% of the contract value. So what I took away from this story is the realm of what's actually possible when you have an employee and an employer coming to the table with creative ideas for compensation. And I think the question we want to lean into today is, can everyday employees and professionals learn something from Otani's story too? Let's get creative. What do you think, Leah? Is the contract like that even in the realm of possibility or feasibility for a a creative genius in the advertising marketing industry. I don't know if I've personally worked with a company that would be creative enough and open enough for something. But there's other there's other ways. You weren't referring to the amount of money, right? Because that's a very rare amount of money. But I would wonder too if the if the listeners thinking as well, had they ever heard of creative contracts like that in in the industry? And as far as I'm concerned, this seems like I've never heard of anything like that in any industry I've been. In. It's usually like. You get an interview, here's the job, here's the thing, you show up, you get paid every year. Just when culture would have us believe straying away from uh, social cliques when you're young will pay off in the future, I find it kind of ironic that the two highest paid types of professionals in society are jocks and the nerds, right? (laughs) So you have professional sports athletes and technology executives at the very top. And when you look at the corporate sphere, tech executives like Tim Cook from Apple, Sundar, from Google, Satya Nadella, from Microsoft, and Elon Musk, Tesla, of course, they represent some of the highest paid professionals and they all fall within the technology sphere. So you can negotiate contracts that are quite large or at really unconventional terms like this, but clearly you need to have some leverage. And each of the names we just mentioned have a lot of leverage in the way that they're either the CEOs or the founders of companies. But I'm curious now hearing about this, why haven't people been more creative across all these different industries. Because as you mentioned at the beginning, Matt, this could actually be really helpful for sustainability purposes, for betting on yourself, right? And taking risks. I'm just so curious why it's emerging in sports and it really hasn't been as prevalent in the business space. Well, it is prevalent in the business sense. I think why this story has ignited such fascination, as I mentioned before, is it really uncovered or opened people's eyes into the realm of what's possible in contract negotiation. And if you just Mm. take it outside of this, sports arena for a second, and you look in the business arena, you do in fact see a lot of business contracts negotiated with unique terms and in unique ways. And so it could be helpful just to, for a second, to look at notable market examples of some of these unconventional contracts in the corporate sphere. And I mentioned some of the tech executives a second ago, Elon Musk comes to top of mind. His contract plan with Tesla did not offer any salary Mm or any cash bonuses. Right. Of course, he's a little unique because he was the founder of it, but instead, it provided a, again, decade-long, 10-year compensation period of stock options, Tesla stock options. And so what you see here is a focus, once again, on the long-term. The entire plan was spread over a decade, underscoring a long-term commitment. And then you also see here of sharing in the profit. So the key triggers for his stock options were market capitalization of Tesla. The amount it's worth essentially had to increase by $50 billion increments, starting from a baseline of $100 billion to unlock each tranche of stock options. I think he has 10 tranches. Correct me. I seem to remember that a lot of people didn't think he was going to be able to meet those goals. Exactly. I think there was a lot of skepticism, young upstart competing against these monolithic auto companies. And most of the bets were like, yeah, it wouldn't pan out. And so it was a lot of risk, but reward in this case. What you see in the corporate sphere is you do see unique terms play out like this. And we'll come to a a second to a really unique term, particularly for tech founders who sell their companies in the form of earnouts. But you do see unique contract terms in the corporate sphere. Historically, it's been relegated to, again, iconic, high-ranking individuals. And I think you're starting to see a trend, Mm. partially because of the transparency of these transactions where some of these terms and triggers can come into everyday negotiations with nonetheless very valuable employees 
but they don't have to be founders or tech stars. I mean, working in the Bay Area, obviously, I know a lot of people who have equity in their companies. And I have wondered, do businesses like an ad agency or even like a mom and pop business, would they not benefit maybe from providing equity to employees in non-tech industry spaces where it's not traditionally done? When you own equity in the company, you care about the company's success more than just, I want this company to be open tomorrow so that I still get paid and I still have a job. So taking a page out of the tech founder playbook, my belief of why equity is valuable to dole out for your young startup or business is because, frankly, you don't have any revenue or profit to speak yeah, of yeah. to dole out. And I think the conceit of asking for equity sometimes, it's a little lazy. When you look at it, there's other terms other than equity, which many of us have watched yeah. that movie Air, where uh, Matt Damon, oh, in yes. the form of the, the agency lead, is negotiating with Jordan's mother about equity. Like, well, that just doesn't, we don't do it that way in the industry. But there's another compensation point that's commonly forgotten that lives within the playbook of startups and young businesses. And, th- and those are earnouts. You know, earnouts, simply bonus payments that are made contingent on achieving very specific performance goals, usually revenue based or profit based or customer number of customers or users. These are so common in the tech industry, particularly as part of acquisitions, that when you hear a big number, for an acquisition, commonly that big number will be like 50% cash or 75% cash, and the rest will be based on earnouts or bonus payments that will be distributed to the founders if they reach those milestones. And so if I'm speaking from the perspective of an, of an employee who might find it a bit intimidating asking for equity from his or her company, well, you don't have to ask for equity. You can come up with a, a creative strategy around earnouts of sorts, bonus payments that are tied to milestones that are really important to the bottom line of the company. And I believe that's becoming more common. I do. It might be becoming more prevalent, but in my experience, this isn't really common with like a regular employee. I know for me, I never even thought about coming to the table with something creative like this, even within the scope of a smaller salary. Or am I just way out of touch living back in the future? I think you may be not just speaking to the universe of businesses that get launched, right? So I have plenty of colleagues who are amazing salespeople mm-hmm. and have approached young businesses, not necessarily businesses that have raised venture capital or a crazy amount of money, but they're profitable businesses and they struck deals early based on revenue and sales. Say, hey, look, I'm going to come bring my talent to help generate a lot of sales for your really great service. And I just want to share on the upside. So I want 15% commissions that maybe end after year one or year two. And over the course of many years, it becomes a win-win situation for both. And so I think this is far more prevalent than people may think. If you just look at the right type of company, particularly maybe younger businesses, ones that aren't venture capital funded, because Mm -hmm. if you're not venture capital funded, you don't have the funds to pay out salaries, so you have to get creative. (laughs) I know my very first LLC I launched before I had raised money was a consulting shop. and, And that's what I did. I hired colleagues of mine from the finance world and said, hey, sell my development services and I'll give you 15% of the contract that the agency pays out. It's more common than you would think. Yeah, I'm pretty late to the game. I think I've only started thinking about it now in the entrepreneurial space. I always thought you just kind of go in as an employee, you're in, you're in need. I never thought about it in the position of having bargaining chips. The last five years, that's a totally different story. Now I feel confident I have that power. Maybe that's part of it too. What changed for you, Aaron? The thing that shifted everything was my initial investment around my storytelling podcast. So the deal I made with myself was, I'm going to do seven-minute stories. I'm going to do it with the only goal of just building an audience, telling stories, and creating an archive of art. And I'm going to take a loss every year on those efforts. And then in the last five years, it started to pay itself back. So that was the turning point. But in my mind, I was always sort of subservient to the company. I noticed this because I lived this too. Before I launched my first few companies, there was a dramatic difference in my own conviction and belief in my ability. Even though my ability had stayed the same, both pre and post launching a business, it was more of a psychology shift. There's like a paradigm shift in thinking between employees and anyone who starts a business, really any business, because more than any set of skills or knowledge, it's a psychology difference. A realization that like, shit, I can actually negotiate with this company I'm doing business with. Such a simple conceit. I feel though, until you've actually lived it and experienced negotiating under it, it's hard to enact. Here's another thing I was going to ask you. 
if you're an employee that's not necessarily looking to go out on your own and be an entrepreneur, but you're interviewing, doesn't that psychology start with the interview too? I never had the psychology or the, the wherewithal to think creatively even before my interview. I was just going in there trying to copy Will Smith and his you know pursuit of happiness speech. And I got really dramatic. I did a monologue. I'm like, I'm going to put myself through a wall for you. And that's great, but it never worked out. It was the worst interviewer of all time. I was going to say, I always thought I was very creative just negotiating on vacation days. And (laughs) would I be able to work from home X number of days per year or things like that? So, I mean, I felt like I was being creative, but clearly there's more that I could have been pushing. I think belief and conviction has something to do with it. Every story you've read of a founder selling their startup and then negotiating they have a lot of conviction and they believe they have a right to negotiate those bonus payments in the form of runouts because they believe the business that they created is adding to the company's bottom line. So of course, I'm going to negotiate with this company a unique contract. Well, again, you could be an employee who's bringing a lot of value to the company regardless of whether you've launched a business or selling it to them. Last week's show, we talked about Dylan who came up with a creative copy way to increase conversion and generate more revenue. His immediate manager didn't like it, but it seems like the CEO was open to it. And so in those scenarios, you want to see what levers you can control from within your own role to impact the business positively and just really lean into those and represent them if you're looking to negotiate terms. As we turn to the next page on what terms you can negotiate, I think the first thing is the psychology component, just recognizing the fact that you do have a right to negotiate some of these terms if you're adding significantly to the company's bottom line. Matt, have you had any person where someone tried to do something creative from a negotiation standpoint with you? All the time and all the startups I've launched. And actually, when I get pitched that, even if I'm not open to it, meaning I may not want to give out extra equity points because I don't have need to. I have enough capital in the bank to, to just pay you, you know, wages. I appreciate it. I don't frown on it. Usually for me, where it's occurred is in the realm of sales. My first startup, which was an enterprise software company, really relied on salesmanship. And some of the experienced salespeople who came in at that time didn't have as much capital to kind of pay out wages. They became creative. And they're like, look, what if we set it up this way where I'll get 15% of commission of the annual contract for the first year. But then since this contract will probably stick around for multiple years, the next year I'll only get 7% and then the following year get 5% until zero, right? And that way, even though you're not paying me a wage to generate these leads, I have a motivation. And we usually work something out along those lines. So I think it's really, really common in the sales world. But I wouldn't be surprised if you had data scientists working for Google or Apple who are rare talents like Shohei Otani, who have unique contracts. It's just that they're not public. We can't read them. Right. One unique clause that plays into the public popular realm, call back to the movie again, Air. Yeah. Michael Jordan, I don't think it was covered in the movie, but in his contract... He actually had a specific clause called the love of the game clause. Love of the game clause, yep. Yeah, and this clause allowed him to play without restrictions outside of the basketball season, something that was very uncommon with NBA players because if you get injured for some trivial reason outside, you just ruin the whole, the bottom line for the You're snowboarding or something like that. Yeah, Yeah. and so he negotiated that, and that's essentially a cause definition for termination, like negotiating, you can't fire me, if I play for the love of the game, he negotiated a cause definition mm. that would limit the termination abilities of the companies. And again, call back to even, I think, three episodes ago, we talked about your social media posting habits and the fact that most of us are at will employees. Perhaps you want to negotiate some cause definitions tied to your at will employment so that if the company chooses to terminate you, they have to have a reason. And again, this is something that's very common in founder contracts. Every contract I ever negotiate as part of my acquisitions, always had robust cause definitions. Matt, you've inspired me to pull up one of my old <laughs> contracts. And under bonus, it says, you'll be eligible to receive a discretionary performance bonus based on factors that may include a combination of your personal KPIs and overall business performance of the company. And mm. overall business performance Not company, right? very <laughs> compelling. Now, in <laughs> retrospect, wish I had negotiated something a little bit more structured there. Specific, where you can see the goal. Yeah, like tied to the pieces of business that I was working on and how they performed. Because yeah, that means nothing. That basically gives them permission to deny you it for any reason. 
One of my earlier pitches I was talking about coming in at a low salary to earn security over time. And sometimes whether it's mid-career, late career, security is really important. There's that other contract saying in baseball, Bryce Harper and the no trade clause that he has within his contract with the Philadelphia Phillies. And I think it's like 13 years and it includes no opt-out clause and a full no trade clause. And it basically just ensures that firm stability and commitment. You could really look at that and I could see how that would be really, I don't know, interesting to an employee saying, let's structure a clause in which we're both committing to commitment and security here, but that's got to be harder on the employer side in traditional business. Right. I would argue that no trade clause in sports is equivalent to having cause definitions in your contract as a private employee for termination, meaning there's no concept of trade, but if you're going to essentially release me or terminate me, it's got to be for good reason in your termination. And this actually happens. This happens. It's just None of this stuff is public with these companies, unlike some of these contracts with baseball players and sports teams are public, so you see it more. But it's going on. And I think when you recognize that, you may be privy to representing yourself a bit more strongly in your next negotiation with your employer. Didn't Jack Dorsey have an interesting salary situation? Was he the former CEO of Twitter before the Elon takeover? One dollar annual salary at both companies, Twitter and Square. It was a symbolic move. Oh, yeah, Square. Given the substantial equity he had in both companies. So just back to the terms part, though, because part of the inspiration for this episode is to see if we can tie this to the everyday worker, the everyday employee. And we mentioned, okay, at will employment cause definition. That might be a term. Leah, you mentioned vacation time, <laughs> work from home. There's a new reality. 401k matching. 401k matching. Your ability to, to negotiate them more competitively has to do with your ability to convince the company that you're valuable. One technique to do that is taking a page from Otani's contract and even Musk's contract is the long-term focus. So if you're going to ask for more money in the form of bonus payments or longer vacation period or whatnot, you want to do it within a lens that shows commitment to the company. So that means you want to try to convince the company that you're committed to them. And what better way than saying, hey, I'm dedicated to the long-term vision of the company. I expect to be with you guys long-term. And so if you're going to have bonus payments that are really large, maybe you tie them to year three or year five of your employment. And that signals to them like, oh, this employee is really serious about you being here for long term. That makes it more digestible to the company. And it shows them you're actually sincere in having the company win, not just yourself. I had not heard of this delayed bonus or, hey, we're going to give you this much bonus, but to qualify for 20% of it or 50% or whatever, you need to still be employed here at the end of next year. It it makes Mm. a lot of sense, especially if you're having an issue with the retention. In that case, though, if you're going to have it trigger also based on time. You also want to make sure, though, that then you have a cause definition in your termination clause. Because oh. what could happen is you hit the milestone, whatever that is, customers, revenue, you name it, users. But then right before you get paid out because you haven't reached year five, the company terminates you and it's oh, at no. employment. So some of these terms go hand in hand, right? Can I state the obvious here? Because I think there's the majority of listeners that are even probably who are younger than me that are much smarter than me. When you go into an interview and when you start thinking about how you can bargain, how you can negotiate, one piece of advice just from looking at it now from the vantage point I'm at is a lot of that psychology shifts when you start thinking about how you can be an asset not just to the job functionality, but to the business as a whole. I know that's weird and it's obvious. I never thought about it that way. As a guy growing up in Ohio in blue collar town, I just thought you went to a place, they had a job, they paid you money, you wanted to get as much as you could in the negotiation, and then you just needed to do that job. I never thought about it like, well, how can I come in in a thoughtful way to actually help them meet those goals And can I do that by bending or shifting or being creative in my contract or my negotiations? Now I think about it, but I think I'm still young enough for that to be effective. But I just wish I had known or heard Mm -hmm. this podcast when I was 22. (laughs) Again, the reason why we bring it up sports is because those contracts are public. It would be amazing if we can have some of the contracts that are negotiated in the private sphere public, because then you can really see what some of these knowledgeable employees within these tech companies are making. But the Bobby Bonilla story, right, Aaron? (laughs) The Bobby Bonilla story. Maybe you just want to share that story. Yeah, so actually, it's funny. We talk about this. This was a interesting deferred contract situation, but it happened really by accident. 
Okay. So Bobby Bonilla signed with the New York Mets. Of course, it's the Mets. And they basically have ended up paying him more than $1 million since July 1st, 2011. What? And the annual payments will continue until 2035. And he retired when? Yeah, it was like dozens of years ago. It was like 15 years ago. He's now 60 and he will be 72 <laughs> when the payments end. In fact, it's become such mythology that they term this day July 1st Bobby Bonilla Day. <laughs> They were caught up in their investments with the Bernie Madoff scandal. All right. And because of that, they had to defer these payments and agreed to defer Bonilla's salary with 8% interest and spread the payments across 25 years. Oh, my God. The Mets organization's cash it was busy being embezzled by Bernie Madoff. So yes. they couldn't cash out or pay out the final payment to Bobby Bonilla. So he got creative, probably with a team of lawyers, said, okay, yeah. Mr. if you can't pay me, Let's come up with creative terms. It's basically an annuity that hits probably till he dies. But to your point, Matt, lawyers and Bonilla got involved and they took advantage of the situation and they negotiated something unique. The opposite example of that just comes to mind is probably public school teachers where you're underpaid your entire career and then you do get a pretty decent pension once you retire. Right. And there's some conversation, at least in California, with the teachers unions about an option where you say no to that retirement pension. Well, that's because nobody has the confidence that those pensions are going to be solvent any longer. Are those funds be really around? there? Are they being embezzled by yeah. Bernie Madoff? Oh. Is there any other examples <laughs> of creative partnerships or contracts that seem different, but that didn't work out by chance? Yeah, there are cautionary tales there. And eBay's acquisition of Skype is a well-known one oh, where a yeah. large percentage of the $2.6 billion deal, that was the the print valuation of the deal. A large percentage of that was earnouts. Again, these large bonus payments that only get made if they hit certain targets like user growth and revenue. And what these founders later ended up arguing and then filing a deluge of lawsuits uh, at eBay for is they weren't being supported in reaching those milestones. And, and this is really common. If you're going to defer revenue based on milestone triggers, then you're trusting the other side to support you to reach those milestones, right? And you can't always count on that support. That's the other leg of this. The creative terms, I think, is, is really where you want to lean in on. And if you trust the other side and you have some negotiation power and leverage, go beyond the standard salary and 401k package. There's more greenfield opportunity than just that. Hey, you made it. Thanks for tuning in to The Lonely Office. If you like what you heard, follow us on all major podcast platforms so you don't miss an episode. And make sure and tap five stars and leave a review. I know everyone says it, but it actually helps others like you discover the show. Remember, the topics you hear us talk about on the show are sourced from Glassdoor communities, where professionals are having candid conversations about their careers anonymously with others in their industry. To be part of that conversation, download the Glassdoor app. And when you're in the app, make sure and join the Lonely Office Bowl. That's where we are. When you're there, you can suggest a topic idea or an episode idea, or you can make it more formal and email us at thelonelyoffice at glassdoor.com. We'll catch you next time. Thank you.